How many of you have ever experienced TSA? You know, at the airport, you know TSA? They're supposed to be like safety, whatever it is, transportation safety people. So anyways, I had an experience with them recently. I'll tell you about it in a second. But the other day, I was reading the news, and there's this young lady. She's about 20 years old. I guess she's from Texas Tech, and, and here's their salute. It's like a gun salute, right? So she sees somebody else in line to, you know, go, you're going through the TSA check. And she does the gun, they're wearing a Texas Tech hat. So she does a gun salute to him. I guess the guy freaked out, turns her into TSA, they pull her, they, like she's a terrorist. She goes, I, no, really, it was just, I was just, you mess around. Anyway, she, she really got the riot act. So anyways, that was her experience. December 2017, not that long ago. We're coming back from doing ministry in, in Texas and Oklahoma and uh, good, good trip, and the team of us are getting ready to come back from Dallas, one of the airports there, and uh, going through TSA. And, you know, it's just, you know, you take off your shoes, you do all that stuff. So it's my turn. <coughs> Unknown to me, I appeared to be a terrorist that day. <laughs> so they, they do a random check. So when we go through the check thing, you know, the metal detector, nothing's beeping or anything. All right, I walk through, I think I passed. He goes, no, you got to go stand over here. I'm like, really? Goes, You've been randomly selected. All right, whatever. I mean, why don't they, you know, I mean, seriously. But anyways, I got my own opinion about it. So I'm randomly selected, and this guy, he says, okay, um, uh, this is what's going to happen in this, this pat-down. He's going through everything with me. Well, this is great. It, seriously, I had rubber gloves on the whole bit, right? So I'm sitting there going, this is going to be, you know. Anyways, he goes, we, right here, or we can go privately, wherever you want. I was keeping my clothes on, so I thought, just here, it's fine. My wife's standing over there, and everybody else is standing there. So they get the wand out, and he goes, do you have anything in your pockets? I said, no, and he sent something with him. I'm like, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I, said, I just have this $20 bill. And he goes, well, hold it up. So I, he goes, keep it there. And, and so he gets out the wand, and he starts frisking me. And I said, I'll give you this $20 if you're nice to me, all right? <laughs> That's what I just said. I was joking. It was just a joke. So he finishes the whole thing. I'm not kidding you. You guys, most of you figured out what happened. He finishes the whole thing, and he goes, stand over here. You are under arrest for attempting to bribe a federal officer. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I freaked out on the inside. I saw my life over. I mean, I read about these things. Ten years, you're in jail. And then he looks at me, and Jackie's looking at me, and other people are like, they, I must have looked like Casper, just white as could be. And, and so, so anyways, I mean, I literally, my heart went from wherever it's supposed to be to somewhere in my body, I don't know where. I was scared. I, it, and then he looks at me, and he goes, ha, gotcha, ha, ha, ha. I, like, oh. I said, I said, at that point, I was happy to be pranked. I, but I can tell you this much, I am not going back to the airport. I don't recommend it. It was just a joke. $20, don't do it. Because you might get a TSA officer that isn't as jokingly. Oh, man. It really scared me. So here's the deal. You and I have a very serious issue. You know, TSA, you're condemned already, right? We have a very serious issue. Our sin condemns us. But God so loved the world that God loved, God gave. I believe, therefore, I have eternal life. So that's the place we're going today, John chapter 3. We are not going to be with TSA anymore for the remainder of our trip this morning. But we're going to be in Jerusalem. It's nighttime. If you were with us last Sunday, remember where we were. Uh, Nicodemus, the Pharisee, the religious man, had been talking to Jesus at night. They had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And and Jesus is talking with him, and, and he tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. And he explains to Nicodemus, um, you must be born of the Spirit. And, and Nicodemus doesn't get it, so Jesus gives him an illustration. Nicodemus is like this. Uh, you, know where the wind, you don't know where the wind comes from or where it's going, but you can feel the effects of the wind. That was in verse 8. And Nicodemus doesn't get it. In verse 9 of John chapter 3, Nicodemus answers and he says to Jesus, how can these things be? I'm not so sure that I'm connecting with this born-again stuff, this 
<coughs> excuse me, born of the Spirit stuff. So from this point on, it's all Jesus talking to Nicodemus. He's answering him and explaining to him. Nicodemus doesn't get this first illustration about the wind, so Jesus is going to help Nicodemus to get it and everybody else get it. So John chapter 3, verse 10, Jesus answers and says to Nicodemus, after Nicodemus says, how can these things be? I don't get what it means to be born again or born of the Spirit. Makes no sense to me. So Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel? In other words, you're, you're a Pharisee, you're a rabbi. And you don't know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Who's Jesus referring to? He says, we and our. He's, re- he's, he's letting us know about the, the, whole, the um, Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're telling you. And then look what he shifts in to himself, verse 12. If I have told you earthly things, he's making himself equal with God. We and then I. If I've told you earthly things, and you don't believe, how will you believe it if I tell you heavenly things? What do you mean? If I tell you earthly things and you don't get it. How are you going to get spiritual things? How are you going to get the heavenly things? He's referring to the illustration he gave about the wind. Here's an earthly thing. Nicodemus, you, you can't see where it begins. You can't see where it's going, but you have the effects of it. So it is with anybody who's born of the Spirit, who has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Nicodemus, I don't get it. Nicodemus, you don't get that. How are you going to get something that's much greater, the spiritual truth? The Bible tells us that. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the Bible says the natural man, that would be Nicodemus in this place, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Nicodemus, what do you mean? Go back into my mother's womb. That was the conversation last week. He's not getting it. It seems kind of foolishness. They can't get those things because they are spiritually discerned. Let me stop here for just a minute and help us work through conversations that we have with friends and family. And um, sometimes we're with our friends and family, and you know, you're, you're, you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're trying to explain something to them, a biblical principle, and they are looking at you like their eyes are going, what are you talking about, right? especially if you tell them you got to be born again. They're looking at you like you've lost your mind. The problem is this. It's they are foolishness. They're not spiritually discerned unless they're in Christ. They're not going to make sense. Think of it this way. We have two different worldviews. When you are in the world, your worldview is of the world. You can have similar things with a believer, but, I mean, there's a lot of people that are, that they look at and they might think, well, there's nothing wrong with abortion, right? And if you're a believer in Christ, you're thinking, that, that, that can't be, that's awful, that's appalling, right? But they have a different worldview because they're not in Christ. And you can go on down the list with various types of things. And you're like, why are they not getting it? The same way you didn't get it. You had a particular worldview until the moment you received Christ, and then you got into the world, and then your worldview started to change, and then you had a biblical worldview. And it probably took time. And so this is Nicodemus. Jesus is talking to him. Hey, you're not getting it. I gave you this earthly thing, illustration to help you understand the spiritual principle. You're not quite there yet. So too with us and our friends. Don't beat them up. Don't be too discouraged when they're not getting that spiritual truth you're trying to give them. Pray for them and understand that that is where they're at. And also try not to talk to them with that Christianese stuff. And try not to speak to them in King James English. It will not work unless you're in a Shakespeare play or something like that. People sometimes think, well, Pastor Tom, he's, he's a uh, pastor, so probably at his house he goes around talking about his kids. Well, my children, if they loveth the Lord and they honoreth my wife because I don't talk like that who talks like that right so sometimes in our in our christian life when we're talking to other people understand we do come from different world views and so jesus gets hey this is where nicodemus is and he's explaining things to him and then he picks up in verse 13 and jesus says no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven that is the son of man who is in heaven So Jesus is saying, I was in heaven, and now I'm standing right before you, Nicodemus. 
Verse 14, and now he gives them another illustration, right? He didn't get the illustration about the wind, where the, you know where the wind, you can feel the effects of the wind, but you don't know where it started, you don't know where it's going, right? He didn't get that illustration, but here he gives them another illustration. Nicodemus says, Moses, verse 14, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's stop here for a couple of minutes, and uh, first main point, only two main points today. And what do we have here? We have an illustration from Jesus about Jesus. Uh, Jesus is helping Nicodemus to understand, I'm telling you this, this is about me. So Nicodemus couldn't understand the other principle that Jesus taught him about being born again. So here he brings in this one who, Nicodemus, you should be able to get this because you're a Pharisee. You're an expert in the Old Testament law. You should be able to connect the dots. So let me tell you, and Nicodemus could connect the dots here because Jesus takes Nicodemus all the way back to the Old Testament to what we would call the book of Numbers. And he talks about the serpent being raised up on a pole. Nicodemus would have got that. Oh, why is that? Because what Jesus is referring to is when the Israelites were in sin, uh, they were complaining. They spoke against God and, and Moses and said, <coughs> excuse me, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. Uh, there's no water. We have detestable food. When I first got married, we got back from our honeymoon. I did this. My wife... I think she's forgiven me. This has been years now. But she made this meal, and she call, I think she called it, I love my wife dearly, but she called it Hawaiian Surprise or something like that. It was, I'm not going to go, I was just going to get in so much trouble. I didn't say it first service, I'm going to stop here. Because my wife is a really good cook now. But let's just say, you know, in the beginning of our marriages, we're both learning things, Right? Me, I mean, me too. You know, I, I didn't start out being perfect. I became perfect after a <laughs> short period of time. How annoying I must be to live with. So anyways, so there's the Israelites are in the wilderness saying, Moses, you brought us up out of Egypt. We have detestable food. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to have leeks. We want to have garlic. Uh, we'd like to go back there. God didn't appreciate the Israelites complaining. So what he did is the King James Bible says that the Lord sent fiery serpents to bite them. Ouch. The Lord doesn't like our complaining. Just, just, just for the record, it's a sin that God takes seriously. Nevertheless, this is what God did. He instructed Moses to make a serpent of brass, of bronze, and lift it up on a pole. And anyone who gazed upon the serpent would live, Anyone who did not gaze upon the serpent would perish. It was an illustration that Nicodemus, an expert in the Old Testament law, would get. He would know. He's told that story. He's handed it down to other generations of rabbis. He's let them know. This is what happened. Moses makes the serpent of bronze, puts it on a pole so people could live. The picture that is presented is both horror and glory. It's, it's horrible that the Israelites were beset by a horde of venomous snakes, so, so many that they could not escape and many died. It was a hideous scene, but at the same time it was glorious because in it we have God's grace and in it we have God's mercy. Uh, by the way, just for the record, uh, this is the uh, symbol for health care today. It's the serpent on a pole coming from the book of Numbers. Isn't that cool? That's right, you have the Bible in the medical industry, I think that's pretty cool. But as we look at this, Jesus with Nicodemus, he left no doubt about the application for Nicodemus. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, the serpent, even though the Son of Man must be lifted up. It's an illustration that Jesus is a picture of the dying sinful world with the atoning cross lifted high. So here's the question, though. Why did Moses lift up a snake, all right, 
What's the deal with that? And why did Jesus make the connection of himself with the snake? Well, think of this. Snakes are symbolic of sin. After all, it was in the Garden of Eden that the serpent tempted Eve to sin. And then with Moses, this is most interesting. We see the likeness of a serpent lifted up on a pole. Now, I want you to think of this. Moses did not lift up a serpent that was on the ground and put it on a pole. What God instructed Moses to do was fashion a serpent out of brass and put the made serpent, who looks like a serpent, you put that brass serpent on the pole. You don't put one of the serpents that are on the ground on the pole. This is significant. Because it's not just a man like you or me that would be lifted up on a pole. That would not do it. Jesus came in the likeness of man, like Moses has the likeness of a serpent pushed on a pole. Jesus comes in the likeness of man, and he is lifted up on the pole. He is lifted up on the cross. Our Lord became the serpent, sin. Our Lord became sin for us. In fact, um, Galatians chapter 3 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. With all of the animal realm from which to choose, God chose the perfect symbol, the serpent, the symbol of sin, and then he, like the bronze serpent Jesus, becoming sin for us. But that's not all. Numbers chapter 21, verse 9, telling the story of the serpent on the pole, goes on to say that anyone who looked at the bronze snake would live. They would not perish. Now, I find it most interesting. Because when you think of it, this is a great picture, when you think of it, this is what you have. The serpent, sin, Jesus becoming sin, lifted up on the cross. The command to look at the serpent must have seemed foolish, but so does looking to Christ who died on a cross for our salvation. For the Bible says, the cross is foolish foolishness to them that are perishing. It makes no sense. One more thing and then we'll move on. Think of this. Moses raised up that serpent high in the camp and all the dying Israelites had to do was look at the pole and be saved. No matter how horribly they were bitten, no matter how many times they had been bitten or how sick they were, they could be saved. Even so, the most degraded, vile, wretched sinner that turns to Christ should be saved. And think of this. Churches often will categorize sin. Um, That sin is really bad. We shouldn't let that type of sinner in the church. Now, we, we probably won't say those kinds of things, but we can have them in our hearts. Pastors can have those things in, our heart, in their hearts. Listen, that's bad. Um, they're, they're homosexual. We don't, those kinds are, no, no, no. The church is not a museum for saints, right? It's a hospital for sinners, right? And she committed an abortion. She had two. But I'll tell everybody in my prayer group so we can pray for her. You start hearing these things. It's appalling, right? No matter how many times one of the Israelites were bitten by the snake, if they looked to the serpent that was raised on the pole, they'd be healed. No matter how bad you've been bitten by sin, no matter what things you've done. It doesn't, it, it, listen, there is no sin too great that you can't be forgiven of. Christ took our sin upon himself. When God the Father sees us, if you're redeemed, he sees the goodness of his son. That is pretty wild because I know me. 
but that's God's grace. In, Nicod- in verse 9, Nicodemus started out, and he, after Jesus told him, how to, you must be born again, he says, well, how can this be? How can you be saved? So Jesus gives him this great illustration about the serpent on the pole. And then, number two, second main point, <coughs> Jesus gives him the explanation from Jesus about Jesus. John chapter 3, look at this. It's this passage that Christians know so well, but I don't know if we all know exactly what it means. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, wow, the world might be saved. I love those two verses. In fact, that's why we have them on the walls when you come walking into the sanctuary because I figure, I figure this, if somebody comes to this church one time and they never, ever, ever come back, but they see those two verses, John 3, verse 16, whosoever believes in him won't perish. John 3, 17, God did not send his son to condemn you. I'm thinking, hey, if 10 years later they think I've read those verses and they get saved and, and they're on their deathbed somewhere, then praise God. The Lord. I look at these verses, and to me, these verses, this is what the entire Bible is all about. So we go to a football game or you watch on TV, and this is how we see it, right? Remember, so if you're old enough to remember, uh, it was back in the 70s and 80s, there was this these this guy or different people that would appear behind goalposts that rainbow hair. Remember that? Great big afro, remember that, all colored and everything. John 3, 16. What does it mean? Tim Tebow like to put it on his uh, face while playing football. So what does it mean? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. Let's think about it. Uh, the term begotten, it means unique, the only one of its kind, the one and only. So, so it's not a reference to a person's origin Uh, So it doesn't mean that Jesus was born and then became the Son of God. It means he always was God the Son and that he is the one and only there are no others. In, In the book of Isaiah, God says it this way, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. This verse reminds me of what we just read about the serpent being lifted up on the pole and Jesus saying the whosoever comes to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Wow. Look to me and be saved. All you from the ends of the earth. And God, there is no other. So uh, the one word is begotten. Another word that we have here is believe. All who believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So what does believe mean? It means to trust in, to commit to, uh, oneself to. A belief that includes a willing surrender to the person or thing you believe in. Right? I I absolutely believe. We often hear within Christian circles where Christians will say something, well, you just got to give Jesus your heart. Now, I know what the intended thought is behind it, but sometimes it's miscommunicated. You don't really see it in the Bible written that way. Uh, But what does it mean? It really is, it comes down to this, a belief of a surrender. I'm surrendering my life to God. I am dead to self. I'm alive to him. He is my king right? It's a, it's a surrender. It's, it, that's what repentance is, to turn from yourself and surrender to the Lord. So let me illustrate it for you. Some centuries ago, there was a king who needed a heart transplant. Now, how they did heart transplants centuries ago, I don't know. But for the sake of an illustration, just go with it, all right? So there's this king centuries ago, he needs a heart transplant, and he's up on the balcony, he's got his guards with him, and all of the peasants are down below. But this king was a good king, and all of the people really loved this king. And and so the the king is on the balcony, and he's got a spokesperson with him. And the spokesperson looks down on all the peasants below who love the king. And the spokesperson says, oh, the king, he needs a new heart. He's got a bad heart. And then the spokesperson asks this question, how many of you would like to give the king your heart? 
Everybody cheered. Woohoo! I will give the king my heart. I will surrender my life for him. Wow, like everybody's saying it. I'll do it. I'll give him my heart. So they thought, well, how are we going to do this since it's everybody? So the spokesperson had an idea. He has a feather. He drops it off the balcony. He goes, this is what I'll do. Whoever the feather lands on, you get to surrender your heart to the king. Which means you're going to die. But the king's going to get your heart. Drops the feather off the balcony. As the feather's reaching the people, all you heard was this. So it is with surrender. Belief. I give you my heart. Another word here is whosoever or whoever if you have the the New King James Bible. What's that mean, whosoever? It means means what it says. It means uh, whosoever. The big word. It encompasses um, you. It encompasses me. (coughs) God so loved the world. So it involves anybody whosoever of the world that would be willing to to believe and give their life over to Christ. Lord, you have my heart. Right? Who started? It's a big word. In uh, Arizona, there's this tombstone marker, this epitaph, for a man named Les Moore. Um, It doesn't seem that his friends mourned him long, because this is how it reads. Here lies Les Moore. No less, no more. Four slugs from a 44. No less, no more. (laughs) Uh, maybe that was true of less more, but it's not true of those who know Christ. When we die, we become more alive than we've ever been. And it's for any whosoever that will come to him. Don't let the enemy of your soul tell you there's no hope for you. If you believe in him, you won't perish, but you will have everlasting life. So what does that mean? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. It means this. God loved, therefore God gave. I believe, therefore I have. Let me give you four takeaways as we wrap things up. Uh, Ready? First one is this. Real simple. It was love, not nails, that held Jesus to the cross. I'm going to give you a picture that will make it really easy for you to remember this takeaway for the rest of your life. All right? Ready? Super easy. God's math. One cross plus three nails equals four given. How long, he says, whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. How long is everlasting life? You guys are good. You guys are, I asked first service, not one person would say, I think they're just afraid. Sometimes first service needs espresso. Just saying. <laughs> that's our secret. Don't tell them. You have friends of first service. But that's it. Let that picture, that's it. One cross plus three nails equals four given forever. Everlasting life. You, you know, I, I talk a lot about heaven here because, quite frankly, when this world can be a real challenging place sometimes um and and heaven the thought of heaven one of the reasons why i talk about bible prophecies because it keeps me heavenly focused while i'm on this earth i need to know where i'm going and you know i i often think about the 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 street of heaven paved with gold that's so pure it's like transparent glass and there's no more coughs there's no doctors not that anything's wrong with doctors we need them while we're here on this earth You'll be out of a job when you get to heaven. Debt collectors will be out of a job, praise the Lord. No funeral homes, no hospitals, you know, none of that stuff. But I was thinking just the other day, I like to grow uh, uh, fruit trees. In fact, there's a bunch of oranges that are out there from one of my orange trees. They're really good. Take some home with you. They're Washington navels. Really tiny this year. I don't know what's wrong with them, but they're really tasty, very sweet. But I like to grow lots of different fruit trees. And... In heaven, just thinking of this, in heaven, you have the tree of life that has fruit that bears, uh, the tree that bears fruit every month, 12 different months. I believe it's referring to 12 different seasons. Because fruit 
is harvested once a year, depending on what type of fruit tree it is and where it's planted, right? You have 12 different types. I think this is so, when I think of heaven, I think that is just incredible. Because here on earth, apart from Southern California, you have, most places have four seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, right? In heaven, could there be 12 seasons, eight seasons? We can't even fathom in our mind that to me. So I think of this, I think, man, I am forgiven. And this place that God has created for us is forever. It's everlasting. And quite frankly, we get to be there together and get along in heaven? To me, that's, that's worth the price. That's, that's, just, that's just amazing. It's everlasting. One cross plus three nails, forgiven. Uh, Takeaway number two, God so loves that in Jesus he removes our sin, our embarrassment, our mistakes, and our shame. Let me help us to understand by defining this word, a perish, because Jesus said, he who believes in me will not perish but have everlasting life. It means to abolish or to put an end to. It's the word that was used by the disciples when they were on the Sea of Galilee and they woke Jesus up and they said, wake up, Lord, save us, we are perish perishing we're gonna die right in the sense it's used in eternity as in this passage god lets us know that if we do not receive his offer of forgiveness then we will suffer the consequences of our own sin and rejection of his son as john MacArthur notes in the sense of eternity the soul does not perish like the body the soul is immortal those who do not turn to christ take with them into eternity unquenchable thirst, terrible passions and appetites, mad cravings, inflamed desires, furious hates and loathings, unforgiveness, bitterness that is torturous and spine-chilling. Those destructive destructive character traits will continue to ravage the soul and will never be satisfied or still. He writes, that is what the term perish is speaking of. But the Bible tells us Peter writes that God's desire is that none should perish, none should experience. So in John 3, 17, Jesus said of himself, God did not send me, God did not send his son into this world to condemn you to perishing, but that through him you might be saved. Wow, that's a good deal. Let's read through the end of this section, then we'll close out. Jesus continues and says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Wow. An old legend tells of a traveler attempting to circle the globe. He found himself trapped in a pit of quicksand. As he slowly sank, Confucius came by and said, Confucius say, it is evident that man should avoid such situations. Then he went on his way. Muhammad came by and said, Alas, it is the will of Allah. He went on his way. Buddha came by and said, Let this man's dilemma be an illustration for many. And he went on his way. Krishna came by and said, Better luck next time. He went on his way. Jesus Christ came by and reached out to the man and pulled him out of the pit. God did not desire that any should perish. He did not come to condemn us, but to pull us out of the pit of condemnation so that we wouldn't perish. And then in verses 19 through 21, Jesus went on to say, and here's why people won't come to me. Because they prefer the darkness rather than the light. The reason people won't come to Christ and ask him to forgive them is because they prefer to sin. There's people who, I'm sure you know some, that have been to church maybe all their life, and then they walk away from it. They they, they never knew the Lord, but they're raised in the church. They understand the Bible. They understand sin. They've even, you can even ask them, do you believe that hell is real? Yeah, I do believe it's real. But they still won't come to Christ. Jesus tells us why. It's not because of intellectual unbelief 
um, it's not because of uh, um, if God is loving, why is there so much suffering? Uh, not those things. Those are smoke screens according to Jesus. According to Jesus, they won't come to him because they prefer sin over salvation. Wow, that's pretty radical. Two final takeaways. Number three is this. God answers our life's mistake with one word. It's grace. We are born condemned, but Jesus came to save us from the condemnation, and he reaches down into the pit, that's grace, and he saves us from the pit. Of course, Romans chapter 8 says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. That's Jesus. Last takeaway, real simple. Number four, there's nobody that God cannot forgive except a person that is unwilling to be forgiven. That's essentially what Jesus is saying here. Nicodemus, let me wrap up the whole thing for you. I've talked about being born again, born of the Spirit, gave you illustrations you can get. The reason you won't come to me and be forgiven is because you don't want to. You don't want to. God can forgive anyone. God so loved the world that whosoever will come to him won't perish. A man who has a disease that a few injections can cure but refuses to take the injections and consequently dies of his disease, has no one to blame but himself. He spurned the remedy, and what followed in his life was the inevitable outworking of law of cause and effect. That is what Jesus is saying about himself. It is the law of cause and effect of rejecting Christ because he is the remedy that has come to save us from the condemnation. He's offered eternal life. We can accept his offer or we can reject his offer. He will not force himself upon anyone. He's a perfect gentleman. But he loves everyone. And the gift of salvation is for whosoever would say yes, I want to be forgiven.